What would happen if Russia attacked the United States? In this video, we'll take a look at hypothetical battle scenarios between the two countries and what their outcome might be. We will assume a one-on-one -on -one contest with minimal NATO involvement. We will also assume that the conflict remains conventional. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many American national security experts were weary of its military buildup under Putin. The Russian military repeatedly boasted about its modern arsenal on the land, the seas, the skies, and even in space. In everything from its T-14 Armata tank to the S-550 satellite-killing missile and even its Belgorod doomsday submarine, Russia was supposedly building a fighting force to rival the best the West had to offer. Then the war happened and most of these claims didn't materialize. Instead, it became a war like many of Russia's other conflicts throughout history – long, bloody, and attritional. The likeliest conflict between the United States and Russia would occur in Eastern Europe. The United States currently has about 65,000 troops stationed in Europe. However, most of these are not stationed in Eastern Europe. About 35,000 of them are in Germany. An additional 12,000 are in Italy, and about 10,000 are in the United Kingdom. The others are mostly divided between other countries in Western Europe. This deployment structure is a legacy of NATO's Cold War dispositions. Only a few hundred of the American forces in Europe are close to the Eastern European front where the war would take place. None are in the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, which Vladimir Putin has long desired to bring back into Russia's orbit. This means that in the immediate term, at least, Russia will have great numerical superiority in men and material. Although Russia has repeatedly proven itself less than effective against modern Western equipment, the combination of numerical superiority and a narrow front along the Baltic, where the likeliest confrontation would take place, would give Russia the advantage in the initial offensive, even if Moscow's military takes disproportionate casualties, which we should come to expect by now. The United States Department of Defense acknowledges the initial disadvantage that American and NATO forces would face in a scenario where Russia invades the Baltic states. There are programs in place to help mitigate this disadvantage, such as Rapid Raptor, which began in 2014. This program is designed to surge the F-22 Raptor to hotspots where it's most needed, because there are only 187 of them, and even fewer fit for combat at a given moment, the F-22 fleet is stretched thin. Though the Air Force plans to begin the sunset of the F-22 Raptor in 2030 in favor of the sixth-generation, next-generation Air Dominance NGAD, fighter, it remains the world's premier air superiority fighter jet for now. With this in mind, the Rapid Raptor program is designed to quickly deploy a package of F-22s and the necessary logistical support to any hotspot in the world and to have the aircraft ready for combat within 24 hours. To do this, the Rapid Raptor program uses the C-17 Globemaster III transit aircraft to support the necessary arrangements for at least four F-22 Raptors. The Air Force would certainly invoke the Rapid Raptor program in a hypothetical confrontation with Russia and Europe. In April 2023, the Air Force announced that F-22s from the 94th Fighter Squadron would be arriving in Poland. These fighters and the supporting Raptors would swing into action, and although they would not be able to halt the invasion on their own, they would be at the tip of the spear of America's combat aircraft in Europe, which would also take part in operations to reclaim the skies over the war zone from the Russians. These aircraft would include F-35s, which have been deployed to Europe since 2017. The first permanent American F-35 base in Europe came in the fall of 2021 at RAF Lakenheath in England. There may be as many as 430 F-35 fighters in Europe by 2030, although not all of them would be United States aircraft. Either way, American F-35s are and will be a formidable force facing the Russians. Russia has the world's second largest number of total military aircraft at 4,173 as of 2022. The Russian Air Force is also the world's second largest with 3,863 aircraft. The United States Air Force has 5,217 aircraft, and America has a total of over 13,000 aircraft in its combined fleet. However, the disparity would not be as dramatic as this in a European conflict, because many of America's aircraft are deployed around the world. With China increasingly menacing the Indo-Pacific region, the United States would still not be able to concentrate as much as it wanted, even if it found itself fighting Russia in Europe. In contrast, Russia would be able to concentrate nearly all of its forces around the war zone. However, that doesn't mean things would go great for Moscow. As we've seen in Ukraine, Russia is reluctant to deploy its air force in full-scale combat operations. That's a luxury that it would not be able to afford in a confrontation with the United States. 
Although Russia would theoretically have numbers, the USAF has better planes and better pilots. Most interestingly, a battle over the skies of Eastern Europe would bring Russia's Su-57 Felon into contact with the F-22 and F-35. The Kremlin has been famously reluctant to deploy its latest fighter over the skies of Ukraine, where it has been used in the war. It's only been in long-range support roles over Russian airspace. Russia would not have that option against the United States. Russia advertises the Su-57 as a fifth-generation fighter, although many experts disagree. Of the four operational fifth-generation fighters in the world, experts regard the Su-57 as the least stealthy. There are also even fewer of them than the F-22. There may be as few as 10 in Russia's active fleet. In 2021, Russian state media reported that the number would increase to 22 in the following year, with a planned total of 76 by 2028. The Su-57 has some reportedly impressive features, such as 3D thrust vectoring which would make it more formidable in a dogfight. Although this ability would pose a challenge to the fourth-generation fighters still in service, most experts do not believe that the Felon would be capable of withstanding a battle with the F-22 Raptor, especially with the situational awareness that supporting F-35s would provide. With the F-22 and F-35 leading the charge, it's almost certainly only a matter of time before the United States would establish air superiority over the skies of Europe, even with fewer aircraft, although Russian air defense systems would be a constant threat. On the ground, things might be a little harder for America. Although the Russian army has proven incompetent in its ability to carry out well-coordinated offensives, it has proven surprisingly survivable and adaptable in the face of new weapons and tactics. For example, at the start of the war, the Russians' drone capability was limited. At first, Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drones under the control of Ukrainian operators wreaked havoc on Russian armored columns and supply lines. Afterward, Ukrainian drone operators used smaller, loitering munitions and first-person view drones to great effect against their Russian opponents. Russia has adapted to these new tactics, however, first with kamikaze Iranian Shahed drones and then with cheap FPV drones of their own. Now some war observers are noting that the Russians are beginning to gain a drone advantage over the Ukrainians. These FPV drones are plentiful and can destroy much more expensive systems. Russia is also now more careful about where it places its critical military infrastructure, such as command and control centers and fuel or supply depots, adapting to the Ukrainian HIMARS attacks from 2022. Both of these things could prove to be a problem for the United States in a confrontation with Russia in Europe especially if the fight is contained to a narrower front where the Russian forces, which would likely still outnumber their American opponents on the continent, could concentrate defenses, troops, artillery, and drones, which can destroy the expensive equipment the United States military depends on. However, the United States would bring much more formidable weapons to the conflict than that seen in use against the Russians by their Ukrainian enemies. For example, in December 2023, the United States took its first delivery of the precision strike missile the intended replacement for the Atakams, which Putin has explicitly mentioned as a destabilizing force in Ukraine. This ballistic missile has a range of 500 kilometers and can be launched from HIMARS, making it mobile and easy to conceal. The United States also has a stockpile of 300-kilometer Atakams missiles, which it would deploy in a European conflict with Russia. These missiles would reach Russian military bases and infrastructure as they are currently deployed in Ukraine and force them even further back from the front compounding communications and logistical problems for Russian forces. While these problems have not been fatal to the Russian cause in Ukraine, the Ukrainians also do not have air superiority like the United States almost certainly would have. The combination of air support and long-range missile attacks would almost certainly take a terrible toll on Russian supply lines, command infrastructure, and battlefield defenses. If the front in Europe is a long one that stretches from the Baltic to Ukraine, Russian defenses would be less concentrated and more at a disadvantage against American air and artillery power. American forces would likely concentrate in one sector and break through in armored drives with air and artillery support. The American Abrams tank has proven to be far more survivable than Russian main battle tanks like the T-72, T-80, and T-90. These tanks are prone to so-called jack-in-the-box explosions because their ammunition magazines are stored in the turret. In contrast, the Abrams stores its ammunition in a protected compartment usually leaving only one shell exposed in the turret at any given time. This is why the Abrams and other Western tanks have tended to be damaged more often than destroyed in firefights with their Russian opponents. Meanwhile, the Russians have few T-14 tanks in service. 
the tank has not been deployed to Ukraine at all. The conclusion is hard to escape. Although war is always unpredictable, the likeliest outcome for a confrontation in Europe is that Russia would have some success in the early going. But as superior American forces deploy to the battlefield in larger numbers, the tide would reverse. Russia could do damage with its hard-acquired experience in drone warfare, targeting important American infrastructure and expensive systems. But Russian soldiers and equipment would have a hard time standing their ground against better organized, trained and led American forces with superior equipment and formidable air and artillery support. Russia might be able to delay this outcome, but not prevent it. What would happen in an even more outlandish scenario? Could Russia launch a non-nuclear attack on the American homeland? Under the protection of two vast oceans, the United States is blessed with geographical shields that make Red Dawn scenarios all but impossible. It does, however, share a maritime border with Russia in Alaska. At its narrowest point in the Diomede Islands in the Bering Strait, the distance between American and Russian territory is only 2.4 miles. The Bering Strait itself is 51 miles. There is precedent for a foreign attack on Alaska. In World War II, the Japanese landed on the Aleutian Islands. They occupied Attu and Kiska in the Aleutians and were eventually expelled after a minor campaign lasting from 1942 to 1943. The likeliest and only remotely realistic attack on American soil by Russia would come across the Bering Strait and onto the Alaskan mainland. These attacks would be led by Russian special operations forces like the Spetsnaz and Marine units. It's unclear what objective they would be aiming at in this sparsely populated area. The three American military bases in Alaska, Fort Greeley, Fort Wainwright and Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson, are located too far away from the Bering Strait and any Russian operation would be detected before it could reach them. But since this is just for fun, let's assume that there's an unknown objective that the Russian drive is going after. The deployment of the Spetsnaz, which would lead this operation in the American homeland, would likely bring them into confrontation with American special operations units like the Navy SEALs or Green Berets, at last igniting a real-world confrontation that would solve an age-old debate, one which has featured as episodes on popular shows like Deadliest Warrior and Ultimate Soldier Challenge. The Russian Spetsnaz are still shrouded in some mystery, which adds to their mystique. The term Spetsnaz does not refer to any single unit, but is rather a collective label to describe Russian special operators in general. Spetsnaz spans the Navy, Air Force and intelligence like the FSB. In one of the more unusual operations of modern times, American and Russian forces were acting as allies in the Balkans in the 1990s and early 2000s. Mark Jaconia was a Green Beret patrolling the Kosovo-Serbia border alongside Spetsnaz forces in 2001, with the mission of disrupting the movements of Albanian UCPMB rebels. After they captured a prisoner, they found the location of a rebel base. The Spetsnaz stormed the base, while the Green Berets provided suppressive fire. This was the only operation where American and Russian special forces cooperated together. Jacona, the American team leader, described his Russian counterparts as having great intuition and instincts in combat, keen on tactics, could shoot well, took care of their weapons and equipment, and were in great shape, and were very well disciplined. He had respect for these badasses in spirit. Things might be different now. Sensitive documents leaked on the Discord platform in April 2023 revealed that Spetsnaz forces had suffered severely in Ukraine, according to American intelligence sources. These documents showed that Spetsnaz forces had been employed in direct combat by Russian officers who were skeptical about their conventional troops' ability. The result has supposedly not been pretty, with the Spetsnaz suffering heavy casualties. Satellite pictures of Spetsnaz facilities seem to reveal this depletion of forces. Spetsnaz units require at least four years of training, according to the American documents, and it could take Russia at least a decade to reconstitute its Spetsnaz forces to their level of pre-war operational acumen. If a hypothetical confrontation were to take place between American and Russian special operation forces in the near future, the latter would likely still be suffering from the experience in Ukraine, facing more experienced enemies operating in their home territory. Russian special operators deployed in Ukraine have also been poorly supported by conventional forces. This was only one of many examples of the Russian military failing to adequately use all the parts of its armed forces in a comprehensive approach to warfare. With the greater distance involved and operations against a much more sophisticated enemy than the Ukrainian military, it's hard to see how even Russia's best troops would operate adequately in an attack against American territory. Getting special operations forces across the Bering Strait without notice would be challenging enough, 
but getting the necessary armor, artillery, and air support would be a steep mountain to climb. Such movements would be spotted by satellite surveillance, making it almost impossible for Russia to conceal the movement of troops and equipment it would need to carry out an operation as ambitious as an invasion of American territory. But again, since this is a fictional scenario, let's assume that well-supported Spetsnaz forces succeeded in attacking the American homeland and get the necessary support they need to open a corridor into Alaska. Since most American forces are not concentrated in this remote area, the initial drive might find success and retake some or much of the territory that Russia sold off in 1867. Russian logistics would need to continue to support the drive. Russia has already demonstrated that this is a challenge in its own backyard, which raises questions about its ability to get supplies and equipment across the Bering Strait and into American territory on a sustained basis. The scenario would likely play out similarly as in Europe, except that Russia would not be able to bring the same numbers to bear in Alaska as on the European continent. If nothing else, the United States Navy and Air Force would prevent any more crossings. Carrier groups would soon move northward to support American operations. Russia would have a huge disadvantage here. It only has one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, and this ship has been in dry dock for repairs for years. The Russians claim that the repairs will be complete in 2024 or 2025 at the latest, but either way, it's only one carrier against the multiple carriers and hundreds of planes that the United States would bring to bear in the defense of its homeland. After initial elements of the Russian forces land, the Russians would need to establish an air and naval presence to support the movement of troops across the Bering Strait. The Russian Navy has a median hull age of 30 years. The United States Navy has a median hull age of 23.3 years. Although this is a difference of only seven years, the devil is in the details. There are only 21 amphibious assault ships in the Russian Navy, and only two of them are new, the Ivan Gren and Peter Morganov. The others are over 30 years old. The United States Navy, on the other hand, has 33 amphibious assault ships. Only 11 of these are over 30 years old. Russia has an advantage in corvettes, with 83 of them, while the US Navy's 21 corvettes are the disastrous Freedom and Independence class littoral combat ships. Even so, the US Navy has a much more modern fleet of 70 destroyers compared to the Russians' outdated fleet of 12. In submarines, the contest is less unequal. The United States has 68 submarines to Russia's 58, and some of the former's fleet will have global commitments. Many of the submarines in both countries' fleets are decades old, with a mixture of more modern submarines. If Russia can use its submarine fleet effectively, it could do some damage. However, some of Russia's submarines are diesel-electric powered, meaning that its fleet cannot run as quietly for as long as the US Navy submarine fleet can. And given the Russian military's history of being unable to combine its units together in a comprehensive set of operations, the US Navy should have the advantage, especially with greater surface ship and air power. Unable to support the invasion force in the sea or skies, it's only a matter of time before American reinforcements throw the invaders back. The original Red Dawn in 1984, which featured a conventional Soviet invasion of the United States through Alaska, was a modest box office success at the time, but became a cultural classic. The premise is far more absurd today. Although it's interesting to think about a Russian invasion of the United States for entertainment purposes, it's entirely impractical to manifest in reality. In a far likelier scenario, involving a dispute over Eastern Europe, Russia had always relied on its local numerical superiority. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, this would not be nearly as pronounced as it had been in the Cold War, even without NATO support. And Russia would be hard-pressed against the superior American troops and equipment that eventually make their way to the battlefield. If the preview in Ukraine is anything to go by, a full-scale non-nuclear confrontation would go very badly for Moscow which would increase the incentive to use nuclear weapons. Let's be thankful that so far, nuclear deterrence has kept the American and Russian militaries from having a head-on collision. But what do you think? What would potential encounters between the US and Russian militaries look like? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.